every once in a while, I, uh, especially this time of year, <laughs> I go through kind of a, I guess, introspection. I look at myself, the sinner that I am, and uh, consider my ways. And I don't always treat myself with as much grace or as mercy as I would towards others. But I also look back on my life, you know, and I, I think about the things that I've been through. And sometimes it's a time of introspection to reflect on how I can help others in a different way or different means. And sometimes it's the enemy coming in and attacking me for different things that have gone on in my past. And just... Lots of different thoughts that I like to reflect on as an older man, having been through so many experiences. And, you know, I thank God for all that I've been through. I mean, the person who just simply flippantly says, Oh, I thank God I went through that, you know, really isn't being honest. If you counted the things that, you know, God may have brought you through, the sufferings, you know, the heartaches, Sometimes the headaches, the the pain, maybe the near-death experience, maybe the healings, maybe the times when you were, oh, maybe not starving to death, maybe you weren't like one of those that said, you know, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his elect begging for bread, but you are one of those that can say, yeah, but I came awful close, <laughs> and it was pretty touch and go there. Or maybe you fasted for a long time because you don't want to admit that you were pretty hungry. Maybe you've been homeless. Maybe you've had a house and you were king of the hill till you became sleeping in the gutter. Maybe you've gone through a lot. But you know, the thing that I find in this time of year, because I go through these emotions... And I do go through moods, and I, they're moods, there's no doubt about them. And I go through my own retrospection, introspection. God uses these things in us if we take them to Him to allow Him to reveal to us what we could become if we just let Him be the potter and we the clay. That sometimes being hurt say, loss of a loved one, or a divorce. Say you were, a, oh, I don't know, married, and you're the other woman. Or say you were, no, let's say, say you're married now, and you were the other woman. Can God forgive that or help you? Does God love you because you're the other woman and you stole someone's husband? You know? My mother was the other woman. <laughs> we never thought of her that way. Matter of fact, I don't think that's what you might have called her in her day. But she didn't really end the marriage. She was just the mistress on the side, so to speak. She never married the man that was the father of my sisters. But you know, we didn't know that. Oh, I did. I kind of knew that he was this guy, you know, that came and visited at Christmas. Sometimes he showed up, you know, odd times of the year, but most of the time was gone. And uh, never knew my mother was married or not married. She never made it a point to tell us. And then later, far later, when my sisters found out, it was a challenge for them to discover that my mother was a perfect. She was the other woman. At the end of my mother's life, you know, she became a great saint, you know, so to speak, is that she was a great impact on the variety of people that came into the library that she managed. She had a wit and a wisdom about her that was quick and sharp. It hit you right between the eyes. It cut right through all the facade that you had up front that you thought you could pull off some kind of spiritually righteous, you know, but she would make you laugh and kind of see things in a different way and kind of pretty practical. So people loved her because of her wisdom. 
and knowledge and directing people to Jesus. My mother wasn't the first one saved in our household. I was. And I admired my mother as my friend. I don't think I ever called her mom. I called her Marianne. More often than not. But the thing I admired most about her was that that life that she lived that was so ooh, rough and tough and independent and strong God brought to very humble, sensitive humility in the end. But it still had that fiery character that people loved. And God used it for his glory in order to accomplish his purpose so that he would take that woman's life experiences and be able to use those things as a platform to experience and show forth God's grace and mercy in a way and demonstrate to people that they would not take from a pastor or an elder or a teacher or anybody else. But somebody that was sassy and brassy like a truck stop waitress who put it in her own words, oh yeah, they listen to that. Funny how that works. You know, the biker that gets saved and he can talk to all the other bikers. The prostitute that goes back out on the streets Starts hookers for Jesus. The woman who is the other woman who now teaches Bible studies about how to be married and stay married. The divorcee who started over and over and over again but now teaches marriage because they've learned. They've accumulated knowledge by way of wisdom. Because you see, wisdom doesn't come by you reading a book and believing what it says. Wisdom comes from life experiences putting blood on the paper of your own heartache and hurt of the very fact that you went through what the scriptures say they are. And you've done those things and you know they're true because they fit your life. It will hurt you, this thing called Christianity. This relationship with Jesus will devastate you. It will cause you to lose your way at times. And it will challenge you down to the very core of your being. But you know what? You come out the other side, you pass through the valley, then you rise over that mountaintop and you kind of get to the other side and you see the green pastures. You look back on your life and you ponder those things that you suffered, that you went through, but now you don't treat it so serious. You'll find that you have become a greater vessel for God to fill because of the life experiences that you have and that you've been through. So your sufferings, though they are not pleasant to go through, and your failings, though they are miserable to be a part of, they're also that thing that gives you depth to the reality of who you were in this life and how God brought you through it by His mercy and His grace. So I hope you aren't too self-righteous, because if you are, you're about to fall. I hope you're not too perfect, because if you are, you'll stumble. I hope you're not too judgmental, because if you are, you're going to be judged. But you know, I hope you're a sinner like me, and that you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and that you bring out the truth of who you were in this life. Whether you sinned, or whether you saved, or whether you were holy, or whether you were unholy and ungodly. I hope you take that life experience and let Jesus make it into his glory and his accomplishment of what he's done with you so you could talk to someone just like you. If you let him, he'll do it. If you give your life to God Almighty and make him Lord of your life, he will turn it upside down everything you've done wrong and to make it right <laughs> you won't believe how he will do it 
and it will dumbfound you, but it'll keep you humble. It really will. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. We suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The glory revealed in us. He knoweth the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come forth as gold. My foot had held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. It shall be done unto you. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble you and to prove you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandment of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. You know, some people think by being afraid of God, they're going to get close to God. And they won't. Some people think that if we condemn the world, the world will come to God, and they won't. Some people think they have to go out and preach God's righteousness and his fire of judgment so that people will want to be spared from hell, so they'll choose to follow God, and they won't. Because you see, it's the love of God that draws men to repentance. A man will follow what he loves, but he will not do what he's told to do because he will rebel at some point in time in his life. He will choose to reject authority and fight against that because he's not accepting as we think he is. He's actually a creature that was born in rebellion, in sin, and his nature is to rebel against authority. Look around. Does not the Christian the same likewise do it against those which they disagree? They rebel. They don't accept authority. No. So, what do we do in regards to this? It's the love of God that draws men to repentance. It's that thing that we say, hey, you know what? I love that person. I want to do something for them to bless them, to make them happy. Did you do what you're doing in order to please your parents? Yes, you did. Lots of times. And that's one form of love you started with. But another form of love was that when you wanted to go find someone that you loved, you fell in love with them and you wanted to impress them. And that's another kind of love. And you wanted to give them something as a token of your love. And that's another kind of love. But the love of God, when you love God, when you want to be with Him, when you want to be near Him, that causes you to turn from doing other things and choosing to do what you should do because you want to, because you love to. So that love is really what causes people to repent. Not condemnation, but confirmation of who God is. So presenting God as fearful, holy, and oh my God, far away, isn't what Jesus came to do. He didn't come to the world and say, hey, I'm the light, you're darkness, get far from me, you're going to hell, I'm not, you come over here, you come here and stand in the light, as I am in the light. No. God sent his only begotten son, that he, as the light of the world, came to us who dwelt in darkness. And he said, I am the light, and the light has come into the darkness. But man did not want the light, lest his deeds be proven what they were and what nature they were. Because if they were of God, they would have come to the light and received me. But they rejected that light because they knew what was in their heart. It was darkness. And their deeds were darkness and they were evil. And they knew that if the light of the world had come into the light, they would be seen for what they were. And so they chose not the light. They chose not Jesus. They didn't want to be seen. And you, yourself, likewise know. 
The only thing that holds you back ever is what you want to do. Because if you love, really, when you love God, if you love God, when you choose to love God, then you would come to God just as you are. It's the love of God. Not the love of money. And not the love of the world that draws men to repentance. By strength shall no man prevail. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, and I will come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom thou hast defied. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone. There is no king saved by the multitude of a host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him and upon them that hope in his mercy. It's never about how strong you are. It's never about the gun you have. It's never been about freedom to bear arms. It's never been about where you live or who you are. It's never been about building up your bank account. It's never been about putting up bars on your windows. But it is about those whom the Lord loves that fear him upon them that hope in his mercy. Both riches honor come out of thee, and thou reignest over all, and in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand is of make great and to give strength unto all. Only you can do these things, O God Almighty, of all. I glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when we fail and when we fall, when we are at our weakest, then we call. Because any other time we think we can do it, then we really find that we've been blind and we can't. The world wants a hero. God doesn't want a hero. He's got them already. The world wants an idol to worship. God doesn't want man to be worshipped at all. The world wants to put something on a pedestal for everyone to look up to. And God wants only one thing, one person to be lifted up. For if I be lifted up, I would draw all men unto myself. God doesn't work the way the world works. So if you really want to be in front of 10,000 people, don't be a pastor, an elder, a deacon, even though there are mega churches. They may be doing the wrong thing. And God wants you to be his servant of all. In your weaknesses, in your failings, in your tribulations, in the worst moment of your life, is the closest that God will be. Then, God will prove to you, in your weakness, He is made strong. 